um, good afternoon and welcome um, everyone um, in, on behalf of the and the head team uh, to our virtual session, uh, Future of Work and Digitization. Um, my name, as you may know already, is Britta Muswalter. I'm one of the partners of and Ahead, and I will moderate the session today and guide you through it. My partner, Carolina, uh, will lead the session as producer from the technical side. So um, please feel free, this uh, whole session is for you. Put in comments uh, in the chat, uh, try to be interactive. We are going to hear really great presentations. Uh, you will get to know um, more insights about the topic, but um, the session is also for you. So we are prepared to have some breakout sessions. Um, where you can interact uh, between the two of you, uh, between two persons. Um, so um, the first part of the session, as Carolina said, during the presentation will be recorded, but not the discussion after. Um, the today's topic is very important to us and especially for our community as it is part of our forum and workshop we do twice a year and also part of our methodology to support and guide individuals on their back to work journey after an extended career break. Why is that? As we believe our community of mid-career talents are looking to return to work or reinvent their careers, they have to first clarify for themselves, what is it, what I want to do in the future with my skills and experience? Where are my strengths and where are the opportunities um, in my sector and where will I be needed? Therefore, we have to look deeper into what I, uh, what also changed during their absences um, and where is the best area, what is the best way to restart and reconnect to the workforce. The World Economic Forum stated at the beginning of 2020 that a reskilling revolution is needed. So more than one billion jobs, almost one third of all jobs worldwide are likely to be transformed by technology in the next decade, according to the OECD estimates. By 2022, the World Economic Forum says or estimates 133 million new jobs in major economies will be created to be able to meet the demands of the fourth industrial revolution. So being in the workforce or out of it and want to return, we are all sitting in the same boat. We have to learn reskill or upskill. We all have to pre be prepared and future ready and look into those fields where we can contribute the most and our chances are the highest to be successful. Therefore, we as Anta Hat um, team feel very privileged today to have two women leaders and experts in the field of data, IT, tech and AI, who will talk about the needs and chances in the sector. Um, but before I go and introduce um, those, um, Stella and Paunima, um, briefly to uh, the agenda I mentioned, uh, it's about um, the presentation will be one each up about 15 minutes. Uh, we start with Stella, then have Paunima. Um, then we are going to have two breakout sessions, each eight to 10 minutes, and then um, it's um, Q&A, so please, within the presentation time or the breakout sessions, if they are coming, you know, questions, comments, please share. This should be an interactive um, session, and uh, we would like uh, it to be, uh, yeah, your session so that you will benefit and um, your questions will be um, answered. So, um, yeah, and um, now I have um, the honor to introduce, um, first of all, Stella Ionidou. Um, she's responsible for IT workforce management at Eurobank, and she today will emphasize on 
where the world or work and technology is heading at. Um, Stella is a reskilling professional and executive search uh, coach based in Athens, Greece. Uh, it's very hot out there, we heard, uh, with more than 15 years of combined experience in various professional roles. Uh, currently, she supervises Eurobank's IT workforce management unit and also is responsible for strategically driving the reskilling needs of approximately 600 IT professionals. Um, but that's not all. She even on her spur uh, time is working uh, a lot um, and that's how we met and she um, last year uh, reached out to me to to really actually support me in what, and us, it was and I had what we do because she found, okay, what you are doing is really valuable. And so um, thankful, um, Stella, for yeah, coming and approach us and uh, we're really grateful to have you. So you are also an ambassador for working parents and an advocate. Um, you do uh, research for this, um, in this field and, um, you want to show also how the skills of parents are relevant to the modern world of work. And you have a blog called the Project Mem Manager. Um, we will put that uh, also in the chat. So for those who are curious. Um, and then um, second, we are going to have Paunima Kulkani. Um, Paunima is responsible for Europe market strategic initiatives and was formerly heading the analytic and insights market uh, practice Europe of Tata, uh, Tata Consultancy Services. Um, Paunima will emphasize um, her presentation on the opportunity in the field of data science and analytics and AI. Um, she is a business leader with a passion for transformation and currently uh, leads strategic initiatives for Tata Consulting Services and uh, in continental Europe. She brings with her more than 21 years of industry experience and has worked with global uh, clientele across North America, UK, Australia, India, and Europe, where she's based, based in Frankfurt. Um, Paun Mina has a management graduate with an electronics engineering degree, uh, has also an executive um, MBA. Um, sorry. Um, executive MBA um, and um, also with a major in entrepreneurship and innovation. So these are very um, topics very close to her. Um, and for the first past three years, she led TC's analytics and insights uh, practice sales in Europe and is an active member of women in data movement. So we are really grateful to have her, she believes that data analytics and artificial intelligence are not only business uh, problems, but also large social and ecological problems. Um, and thereby data science and AI, according to her, are the skills for the future and are great career options, especially for women. Thanks for joining us today and sharing with you our insight, your insights, and now I hand it over to Stella, who will be our first uh, speaker. We are very much looking forward to you, uh, to your speech. And the stage is all yours now. Thanks so much. Um, I'm very grateful for being here. Thank you for the invite. It's always nice to uh, uh, attend the workshops of uh, End Ahead and uh, experience this lively community of people who want to uh, support each other. So thanks for that. Uh, just a small disclaimer before I begin. There's a two-year-old uh, dinosaur roaming around. So any screaming you will hear, that's little Jason. Feel free to say hi. Uh, just allow me a couple of minutes to uh, share my screen and turn on my presenter mode because I have some uh, slides, only a handful, I promise, to uh, accompany my uh, brief presentation today, our, our, our brief talk. And let's do this, and then let's do this. And I think that you can now see my slides, right? Yeah? Good. 
Um, so uh, I'm Stella, I'm from Athens, and I work in a field called um, workforce management. So um, whenever people ask me what I do, I find it a bit hard to explain because um, depending on what aspect you look at it, our job um, and you know the, what do we do, how we impact the organization is is complex. So some of my colleagues view that what we do is like we support coaching and decision making on who attends what training and why. Um, I find it impossible to explain to my mom what I do, so I just tell her that I, I work in training of professional people, and um, we work a lot with. Uh, uh, data and analysis to support this decision making because um, I genuinely think that what we do in uh, I workforce management is, is an art and a science at the same time. We want to help people build sustainable careers and at the same time those careers to be aligned and support the strategic plan of the organization. Uh, Eurobank is one of the four uh, systemic banks in uh, Greece. It has more than uh, 8,000 uh, people and spreads in uh, many uh, European countries as well. And IT, the IT workforce management unit is responsible for approximately um, 600 pro IT professionals. Um, and the, the role um, mix is kind of diverse. We don't just have the typical uh, software engineers and uh, IT operations people. We have project managers, we have business analysts, financial analysts, our risk analysts. Like there's a, a diverse mix of profiles and uh, skills that each and every one of these uh, uh, roles bring to the to the table. In our talk today, I will attempt to reflect a bit on, on the current um, world of work in, uh, in technology and uh, give some pointers that uh, aspire to paint a clearer picture of uh, how we can navigate our, our careers in, in uh, such a changing landscape, such as the, the technology landscape. So um, these are the, the figures from the uh, European Union Skills Programme. And um, uh, I myself, I'm an engineer. I, I have uh, one of my degrees is in electrical engineering. And back in the days, uh, no one told me that one of the skills that may come in handy to me in the future would be like public speaking or effective communication. They told me that you're an engineer, you will be trained to solve problems in the most mathematical and physical way possible. And that will be enough for you to have a sustainable career in the, uh, in the workforce. And um, the way I saw it and the, the way I experience it now, like 15 years in, I see that my engineering and my technical skills alone are not enough to um, uh, you know, grant me this full proof, future proof uh, career. There are approximately 7 million people in, uh, in the European Union working in the, in the field. And um, when I was starting my, uh, you know, my, my university times, um, my dad and everyone older than me told me, like, get a job in tech because you will always have a job. There will always be enough open positions in, in technology. And um, the European Union's uh, latest figures do not really support that claim so much. They show that uh, by 2030, for every 100 new jobs in technology, in a, for one, um, 100 new jobs posted, only 20, about 22 of them will be on technology. And what does that mean? It means that the market is actually saturated right now. We have, a, a, we are, we, it shows that we have more technology professionals than we have jobs to, um, to assign to them. And um, the question remains, like where will these people be absorbed uh, by the market if they don't change something in the way they, they approach work? And I found it interesting to actually show you a map depicting like the European Union and uh, okay, UK is still in there, you know, feel free to. It's like the Europe, Europe and countries. And the darker the color, the, the gloomier the prospects for technology people. It's like they have far more people than uh, they have jobs for. And Italy and Romania and Germany are one of the countries that uh, are in that uh, position. In, in Greece, where I come from, it's still some capacity limited to an additional. 10 percent but it won't be long until we see the same picture in like five or ten years time 
And you, it's counterintuitive if you think about it. Like everyone thinks that technology is the future. Why is uh, I, why aren't, aren't there enough like ICT jobs for the ICT professionals? And the reason for that is that the market is undergoing a huge, huge transformation. Like um, the way we work is shifting. Uh, what work is there to be done is changing because there's all sorts, all sorts of new technologies uh, coming, disrupting the business and the industry. The number of players who can perform the work is different. And where we work from uh, is totally different. I mean, I don't have to tell you now after the COVID extravaganza, uh, we see that uh, we don't need offices anymore in many cases and in many industries. All you need is like, like a desk and um, if you were to go to a workplace, physical workplace, it would be because it would be a space that would promote collaboration, creative thinking, and actually help teams perform better. But also automation and how it's entering, what works needs to be done. It actually, uh, some uh, jobs, some traditional positions, like people who would uh, uh, do cleaning of uh, databases hand by hand. Now, you don't need such a person because AI does that in itself in most cases. Or um, do I uh, always need to be on a nine to five uh, professional uh, relationship with an employer? No, it could be a gig. It would be a, a full time or a, or a part time. I could freelance. There are so many options and this heavily impacts every company's journey to uh, the future of work, depending on which market you're in, what's the business strategy in hand, and uh, what um, outcomes are expected and how fast they change in uh, each uh, dimension. And that's Jason. So um, we see the new role of technology is the business in the business world is affecting the uh, IT disciplines and everything you get to learn at uh, a technology school. Even technology itself is changing and now uh, we see the terminology is changing. We see traditional roles who were very hot like 10 years ago, like project manager and business analyst. We see those roles so saturated and we see the market shifting. Uh, its focus, not just on a successful, unique, individual project, but on a successful product, which will be the outcome of many successful projects and very high levels of business analysis to make sure you're creating the good fit between the solution and the client's needs. And we see roles like the project management coordinator role, um, to be um, declining and we see uh, industries looking to hire people who understand better the finances of technology rather than how to manage um, many projects altogether. Or we see that uh, roles like uh, the people who are handling the relationship between the business and the IT actually to gain a broader perspective and understand, being able to understand both the business and the technology uh, landscapes. And the way um, uh, you can see it is that um, with evolving roles come new competencies, competencies that weren't here 10 or 15 years ago, but they will be here on the next 20 to 30 years. Like the traditional technological skills of thinking in a system or being able to uh, solve technical problems. These are not the problems the business has right now. The problems that the business is facing right now is people who have enough emotional intelligence to understand how their decisions affect others or people who are creative enough and can come up with solutions in a different way than their competition or people who can manage tough situations and um, um, uh, conflict uh, in, the, in the world of work. So you see that although we're discussing the technology field, the, the, the skills that are on the rise are the soft part. We don't, the, the problem that we're facing is that it's not that we don't have enough programmers to know uh, programming language amazing, which is the new programming language. No, you see that everyone's grasping the technological stuff, but people are, are still uh, are, are, are still have steps to go until they, um, they uh, reach to their full potential on their soft skills or creativity, understanding complex uh, business challenging, dis making a hard decisions and uh, making sure that they uh, secure engagement of their people or of their clients in their business decisions. And 
skills do matter. If, if you see the, this chart, like the from the left to right is the least skilled people from the most skilled people and the blue one are the people who are employed. You see that the people who are employed the most are the ones who are skilled the most. But okay, and when I say who are skilled, skilled to what? Skilled to the skills that we actually help you build sustainable career, like the, the ones that we uh, discussed. But that's the juicy part. So how do you develop those uh, skills? So in, in, uh, in there, there are many ways to, to achieve this. And not every uh, road passes through the, the workplace. Because for example, if you're not there yet and you're looking for a job right now and you're not employed currently, how can you develop the skills that you need and the, that your employer needs before you, uh, you get hired? So there, there are many ways to, to tackle this. And I, I have a, my, uh, the, the ideas that come to my head have three pillars. The first one is, okay, find an employer who will uh, understand where you come from, who will help you grow and develop those skills that you need and make sure you enter in a role that's not declining. Enter one of the evolving roles so that your job is, remains in context for the next five to 10 to 20 years. So this is the, the first part. But this, that's not just it. The second part is that even out of the work, place. There are many occasions where you can develop skills that are relevant to the workforce, that they are transferable totally, like working parents, for instance, to whom I am a, I'm a huge advocate, get to polish their planning skills on a daily basis, and they don't really have to be project managers or work in a, on a project management role in some um, big multinational company. So, you, you, you pro have, if you reflect what you already know, um, I bet you know more and you have more skills than you give yourself credit for. So find opportunities uh, meaningfully and wholeheartedly to acknowledge these opportunities and practice them more. Do pro bono, engage in communities where they are interested and uh, help develop the skills that uh, will help you um, sustain, uh, make a sustainable career. And uh, of course, um, make sure you find yourself a mentor or three, a support network to help you uh, achieve your goal because there is no silver bullet to each and every person's uh, career in technology and in other fields. Everyone has to carve their own path and has to be shaped by their personal preferences and uh, where they come from. For example, in the bank, we're committed to bringing in the best talent, but technical acumen is, one, is only one of the three factors we're, we're evaluating. We're looking for great attitude interpersonal sensitivity, people who can handle uh, tough situations. And um, I think I will um, wrap up by saying that um, create, create conditions to support your growth and involve yourself in as many uh, growth experiences as you can because you need all the soft skills you can get for a sustainable job in technology. But at the end of the day, the future of work is getting more and more human and technology, the technology field is no exception to that. So I'm here for any questions you might have. Thank you so much for your attention. And yeah, me... thank you so much, Stella, um, for this uh, great presentation and to learn that, you know, the technology world is human and is needed with a lot of human skills, which are creativity, cognitivity, and also emotional intelligence. Um, so um, thank you for sharing. And um, please, yes, uh, as um, we said at the beginning, please enter some, some of your questions uh, to Stella or to the topic into the chat room. And now um, we um, are sorry, to, um, uh, Wing had a question for uh, Stella. I think she was asking what is the percentage uh, uh, in the previous slide that she had mentioned. So maybe Wing, you can take it on. Yeah, I think that was just a technical question. I think there was one slide that was showing the different skill sets that were some uh, evolving. And um, I just wanted to understand that percentages. Is it like what's currently or already available? Or I don't know. Right. Just the, the blue part, the dot part is that where we are today and uh, the triangle part is where we expect to see this in 10 years time. And this comes straight from uh, Deloitte's human capital uh, management uh, white paper 
who are very mm -hmm. um, skilled in, uh, you know, not very skilled here, they focus uh, very much on uh, competencies and uh, skills and uh, their future and their impact in the world of work. Okay, thank you. Thank you for thank taking you. this um, question. We are going to have the Q&A the whole at the end. Um, so collect your thoughts or put them out there or write them down in the meantime. Uh, we're coming back to those and we try to, to cover every um, question. Um, but now let's um, hear uh, Paul Nima. Um, and um, yeah, Paunima, uh, we are looking forward to your insights. Uh, the stage is now yours. Thank you, Britta. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Stella, for your insightful presentation. I think it set the right stage for my presentation. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I will try and wrap it up uh, slightly sooner so that we have more interaction, more time for interactions. And I'm going to share my screen quickly right now. Just give me a second. Okay. Just give me a thumbs up if you are able to see this. You see it well, Ponima. Okay, thank you. Carolina. Okay, so we're going to talk about future of work in data and analytics and AI, artificial intelligence domain, which is also an area of passion for me. Stella has already set the stage right. And of course, data and analytics and AI is the skill of the future from a technical perspective, but there is a whole lot of uh, human perspective to it. And that is why uh, we thought it is a good idea to pick it up, okay? So I'll just move on. Uh, so in this slide, uh, I, I am sure all of us are familiar with some of the things like Amazon, uh, WhatsApp, Reddit, Netflix, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Basically, we are generating a whole lot of data, okay? And it is coming in high volumes, ultra high volumes, and at a lightning speed. So basically the picture says it all, that which each passing minute data is growing exponentially, such that it is measured in terabytes per second. And in last 10 years, it has grown 50, 45 times. In fact, IBM says it has grown, uh, last three years it has grown more than what humanity has generated before that. So to be able to deal with this high volume of high speed data, which is of different kinds, we, we need mechanisms. We need people who are skilled, who, who can actually make sense out of this data and help to make our lives, our businesses, our work better, right? So this is the opportunity space that we are talking about when we are talking about the data science and the artificial intelligence, right? And just to support that argument further in terms of the European data economy projections by the European commissions, by the way, all these numbers are from the data strategy and AI strategy reports of the European commission under their digital Europe program. So you could see here, from 2018 till now, the data volume has grown by 530%. Uh, the data economy, the value of data economy has grown from 300 odd billion to 829 billion. The number of data professionals is projected to grow uh, almost double by 2025. And of course, the digital skills are also improving, but it's not enough. We, today, the European Commission says that 52% of the, the uh, IT workforce needs to be reskilled in the digital skills. So that's the opportunity space we are talking in terms of data and analytics. As regards AI, again, um, some similar mind boggling numbers in terms of the uh, increase in investment, in, increase in uh, research. Um, now the funding has been increased from 3.2 billion in 2016 to 20 billion 
per year and it's even growing more. And what European Commission intends to do is become a very self-sufficient, highly regulated, very transparent, but very sophisticated data economy under the Digital Europe program. And uh, you know, while protecting the privacy of the citizens and helping in general to make the lives better. And for that, they are running the programs on top of it in terms of cyber security, in terms of healthcare, in terms of smart cities. All of these use cases basically have data at their foundation and AI built on top of it, right? So this basically makes a very huge business case for putting our energies into building data science and AI uh, skill base, which is human, which is not purely doing the data and analytics or AI in technical terms, but applying that to solve uh, the larger problems of healthcare, smart cities, regulation, and in general, a better life for citizens, right? So this basically establishes the opportunity, right? Now, can you guess what this picture is? Okay, I mean, because we don't have time, I'm just going to break the suspense. Basically, this is a picture from 1939. And what these British women are doing is, basically when you travel through my, uh, London Metro, you return your ticket as you exit the station, right? So the women are basically, were employed to, uh, to analyze this big heap of tickets to understand the patterns, okay, which, which routes are busy, where we need to add more capacity, um, where do we need to add more stations. So the London Metro employed the homemakers or the women to basically collect that data, organize that data, and help them understand the patterns and insights. So in today's term, it's actually all these heaps of tickets is the big data, okay? And imagine the amount of manual effort that was going in just to answer one business question as to where do I add new uh, routes? Where do I add new station? How much capacity should I plan? Even to answer that question, they would take months of data gathering and analysis, right? So if we, if we put this in today's perspective, then what does it mean? So there are two steps in, in any, and this is an oversimplified view, right? So we have to first prepare the data, okay? And then we need to generate the insights and use those insights to make decisions, okay? So since 1939, today, after 80 years also, it is established fact that to prepare data takes at least 70 to 80% of effort. And only little effort remains to actually look at the patterns, understand the data better, and use it to use it intelligently to make uh, generate insights, which actually then the AI uses for automation, right? Uh, automating the decision. So when we and imagine the the data is exploding, right? So the prepare data part is going to need more and more, more and more effort. So how do you actually make sure that even if the data grows, you don't have to throw people at the problem? The technologies that are there today uh, on big data analytics, AI, come to our rescue, okay? And this is where a lot of uh, play in terms of earlier the human effort was going mainly on the standard repetitive task of preparing the data. But today that big data technology, the AI are actually reducing the human e effort required uh, to prepare the data, those standard repetitive tasks. So the what remains is human creativity, ability to understand complex uh, situations or patterns, uh, ability to intelligently read that data. And that is where more and more human effort is going. But this, this pyramid is yet to flip, okay? But the future skills that Stella talked about is very, very relevant if we have to really flip the pyramid on the left side to the, to the future state. And this is where most of the data science and AI will, will, will come in handy, okay? 
So what are the skills that are required to get into a data uh, science or AI related jobs? So from my perspective, data and a lot of ready-made algorithms are always at the core, uh, even in 1939 or today. Data is there, data has been there, data will be there. So now to be able to process that data into some meaningful insight, which leads to a very smart decision, you need three things. One, you need the context, the context in which that data is generated. Let's say a credit card fraud, you need to know the credit card uh, business process, right? So then you, you need the technology to be able to gather the data to be able to generate the insights. But more so you need is your ability to define the problem, ask the right questions, assess the quality of the data, um, use creatively the, the patterns. Because the technology, like we saw in 1939, it, it was manual entirely. It keeps evolving and more so in last 10 years, it has evolved exponentially. And we humans can learn the technology very quickly. It is only 15 to 20% of the capabilities required. But business context also evolves because if you see banking, the, we have moved from branch banking to digital banking and many of us don't know where the branch of our bank is today. But the business context probably was a little slower. But the skills that Stella talked about and the skills of future creativity, problem solving, uh, critical thinking, leadership, to be able to embrace this change for human good will remain. Okay, So if you really want to be a good data scientist, a good AI uh, engineer, then what you need is your ability to understand the problem and creatively solve that problem and creatively use that technology. Right. So this is where this is, and of course, there is a huge amount of resources available, be it the technology companies like Microsoft, Google, etc. They provide the platform. They provide all the contraptions. Um, universities and industries, they provide the business context. But what you really need to hone is your, your ability to use all these resources to solve the problems of the future. So <laughs> I will just close with two thoughts. Traditionally, even we grew to understand careers as we learn, we go to the university, we work and we retire. And we keep doing the same thing for 35 years of our job. But today we are in the gig economy. And what is required is every few years, you just reassess what you are doing, whether it is going to be relevant, like Stella said, what is going to be relevant? How is it going to transform? Then unlearn what you have learned in the past and relearn what is required. And this very much applies to the context of data science as well. So finally, I'll leave you all with a thought. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. So ladies, keep learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manima. I am happy to take any questions or we can proceed to the big breakout, whatever. Yeah. So, thank you so much, uh, Paumina, for uh, this really interesting uh, presentation and uh, encouraging all of us to, to learn, <laughs> to keep on learning, as this is definitely one area which um, changed so much over the uh, last year. So when I think about when I grew up, you learned a skill and then you would, you know, become a would um, study law, you would become a lawyer and keep on, you know, being a lawyer. Today, and that's why we think this topic is so uh, important and ahead, we also say one career is not enough and it's not only not enough, it's, it's more careers are needed. So you have to continue to learn, unlearn and relearn. 
I really like this trilogy, um, Paunima, you are using here, and uh, it's very, um, it stays in, in, in my mind since you first shared it uh, two, three weeks ago. And uh, so, uh, hope you all enjoyed uh, the two presentations. Um, and uh, as we are such a nice group today, uh, we also want you to get to know each other and think a bit more and exchange uh, some of your thoughts uh, about this topic and what makes you curious about, um, about the topic today and how do you believe technology, data science and AI will influence you in your sector. So we are going to break, um, put you all in breakout uh, groups um, to discuss those two questions for about a 10 minutes. Um, and, um, and then after two, uh, 10 minutes, uh, we will get you all back um, into the main audience and then we are going to have the Q and A.